Hello, everybody. Today we are going to begin uh, chapter 13 in dynamics. So this is lecture 10. The last lecture that I did uh, is I had originally called it uh, dynamics lecture 10, but I uh, edited that and have referred to it as 9A because we didn't cover any new information. We just finished off chapter 12 and we did a problem solving session from chapter 12. So today we'll do uh, lecture 10, which will cover section 13.1. And having said that, we'll come over here to the document cam and start talking a little bit about section 13.1. The title of chapter 13 is the kinetics of particles and we've already been talking about the kinetics of particles but we're going to break it down a little bit differently we're going to talk about energy and momentum methods so we're still talking about the same ideas when we talk about kinetics remember uh, we're discussing forces and the causes of motion, not just the geometry of motion, but we're talking about um, the causes, which are normally forces. So the first thing that we need to discuss is what is energy? And then another concept, uh, what is work? All right. There are a couple of things before we get into the math that we need to talk about. And the first one is that in general, in Newton's universe, energy is conserved. Um, but when I say it's conserved, it changes form. So this is not 100% uh, true if we start blowing up atoms, for example, we have mass changing into energy, uh, which we're not going to do in this class. So we're not going to talk about that sort of thing. We're just going to talk about things happening in, uh, in our everyday universe. But if we start talking about work, a work, uh, the amount of work is a force acting through a distance. Okay. And I bring up these definitions because in everyday life, uh, we talk about um, we talk about work in pretty general terms, and we also talk about energy in pretty general terms. So we use them in a common uh, a common way, which is not a scientific or engineering way. And basically, if work is a force acting through a distance, force is a vector. And a distance that it acts through, r, is the terminology that we use, is also a vector. But energy, or the differential of energy in the way that I have written here, is a scalar. Or, in other words, it's an amount. Okay? So, because it's a dot product, there's a little bit of a directional property. In other words, if you have a weight like my calculator, and I lift it up, I'm doing work against gravity. And the direction of the work that I'm doing is, is up. So there's some dimensional directional property to it, but it's not exactly the same. If I take, the ca if I take my calculator and I push it at an angle, uh, the work that I get out of it, because the force is acting downward, is just the amount of distance going upward. In other words, it's not the entire path of the motion. So it's, as a dot product, there's some directional property, but it is a quantity in terms of, um, in terms of that. It's also an inexact uh, differential, which means that we can't really, if we do the antiderivative of this, we can only say the work done from one to two, uh, which is going to be equal to the derivative of, excuse me, the derivative, she says, 
the integral of f dot dr. Okay, so we have to take in mind that since this is a dot product, that that is going to be equal to, if we have a force, for example, acting in this direction, and we have uh, the distance operating in this direction, this would be like lifting a weight against gravity, that the angle between those two things is 180 degrees. And so if I take the cosine of 180 degrees, that value is minus 1. So in other words, if I push against something and it moves in this direction, um, this angle is a straight angle. It's actually just a 0 degree angle. And the cosine of 0 degrees is a positive 1. So in other words, all of the work here and in the opposite sense, all of the work here is manifested. But if we push, if we are moving the calculator, lifting it in this direction, the only piece of it that, uh, that, gets, that gets turned into work is just the part of the direction that goes against the force. So that in general, when we talk about this, um, this magnitude, we can talk about, I want to relate it back to the picture that they show in the book. If we talk about some sort of a force acting through some sort of a distance, and we call this angle between them alpha, that the work done from state one to state two is going to be F dS times the cosine of the angle in between them, which you can't see. All right? So work can be positive or negative, and its magnitude depends on the geometric relationship between the force and the direction of movement, uh, but it is not a pure vector. It's an amount. So here's another question. If I push on this table downward like this, and I push with a great deal of force, how much work am I doing? Zero, because it's not moving. That's exactly correct. I have to make the table move in order for work to be done. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not exerting force. It just means that there's no actual work being done. All right. So what that tells us also is that the units of work, oops, I'm going to zoom out on this a little bit. There we go. So you can see that a little bit better. The units of work are going to be units, uh, dimensions of force operating through length. So in the SI system, we're talking about Newton meters. And in the US customary system, we generally are talking about foot pounds. which technically you write the unit of force first. So the official abbreviation for that is a pound force times a foot. Just like when I was talking about something else, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I've never heard anybody call the unit of work a pound force foot. It's always referred to as a foot pound. But you're not going to lose credit, but just to let you know, this is the official uh, designation of that unit. All right, now there are other types of work, and if we go back to this uh, definition of work from one to two being equal to the integral of a force acting through some sort of a distance, or the dot product of those two things, we can also talk about, um, well, we already kind of did the work done by gravity or work done against gravity, I guess I would say. Because that angle, gravity always acts down. If we push something up, uh, we're going to get negative. I don't know why they do this. I'm going to go U from 1 to 2 uh, is equal to negative force uh, times dy, right? Because we're talking about this being up and this angle being 180 degrees. or 
if we're talking about uh, something uh, being pushed upward, it's actually equal to the weight times the delta y, because the weight is constant. And so the work done by gravity in lifting something is going to equal negative weight times y2 minus y1. Or in other words, the final position minus the initial position. Or since we have a negative here, we can write that by reversing these. And we'll still get the same quantity. Another kind of work that we look at is the work done by a spring. And you may remember that if you have a spring, the force required to extend the spring is dependent on how stiff the spring is, right? So they refer to the stiffness of the spring as the spring constant K. So the force uh, of a spring is equal to K, the stiffness constant, times X, or the stretch of the spring. Now in this case, K is going to be uh, in either, well, it's in units, it's in dimensions of force per length. So newtons per meter or pounds of force per foot or inch, depending on sort of the numbers that we're dealing with in terms of the spring. If it's a very stiff spring, we may have um, kilonewtons per meter or mega newtons per meter. And if it's a looser spring, we may just be in newtons per meter. Uh, but anyway, these, these are sort of the more official units of that spring constant, which gives us a force then in either newtons or pounds, right? And so if we take a look at the expression for work as the work done as we pull a spring, it's going to equal minus the force times dx because why? When we pull against this, uh, we pull in the opposite direction of the force, I guess would be the best way to do it. So that u from 1 to 2 is going to equal negative f, which is kx dx. Take the antiderivative of that. And so we get that that's equal to minus kx squared. Um, evaluated at the beginning point and the ending point. So x2 squared plus kx1 squared, because minus a minus is a plus. Or we can say, oh, and it's 1 half. Got to still do my integrals. So I could say it's 1 half k times the quantity x1 squared minus x2 squared. All right, now since we talked a little bit about orbital mechanics, we can also talk about the work done by a gravitational force. Anytime we have a force, we can put it into that integral and create an expression for the work done. So we know that the force, if we have something <coughs> orbiting, that the gravitational force, and this also works on Earth, it doesn't matter, uh, it's a more general law of universal gravitation, that the force is equal to the universal gravitational constant, not little g, not 32.2 feet per second squared or 9.81 meters per second squared, but universal g uh, times the mass of the larger object times the mass of the smaller object divided by the square of the distance between them. So if you're talking about an orbital, uh, something maybe orbiting the Earth, big mass would be the Earth, little mass would be the object in orbit, and R would be the distance between them. Or if you talk about a human being standing on the Earth, you talk about uh, R being the distance from the center of the Earth to the person, or in other words, the radius of the Earth, the radius of the person being little mass, the radius of the Earth being the big mass. But in either case, the force is equal to this quantity. So if we then uh, take into account the fact that du then, once again, we're operating against a distance, it's going to equal minus fdr. We can plug in this expression 
for f. And if we then do this, take that, and we can realize that g, m, and m are all constant. So we can say that u from 1 to 2 is equal to minus g capital M times little m. And then we have uh, dr over r squared, or you could think about that as being r to the minus 2 dr. So this becomes r to the minus 1 times minus 1, uh, or 1 over r, evaluated at those two distances. There we are. And so if I think about R, what are they calling it, R2 and R1? So there we go. So we have minus, minus. So that's going to equal G M M times 1 over R2 minus 1 over R1. All right. All right, so those are just some different forms that the equation takes. But any time you have force as a function of a distance, you can take, the, take it down to an integral and compute the work done. Okay. All right, now the next piece of section uh, 13.1 is to talk about the principle of work and energy. All right. And the principle of work and energy basically tells us that the work done between two states is equal to the change in kinetic energy between those two states, okay? And that's for kinetic energy uh, being converted into work. Now, in your book, and it's commonly held, that T is the variable used to stand in for kinetic energy, and that in general, kinetic energy is equal to 1 half M times the velocity squared. So, Using that symbolism, we can say that the work done from state 1 to state 2 is equal to T2 minus T1. Or we can rearrange by saying a T1 plus the work done from state 2 to state 1 is equal to state 2. And or is equal to the, ener the kinetic energy of state 2. So the work of a force is equal to the change in kinetic energy of a particle. Um, now, or you can say that, like I just said, that the initial kinetic energy plus any work that's put into the particle is going to equal the kinetic energy point two. Now, this has one very big limitation that they don't really talk about, which is this is in the absence of uh, non-conservative forces. So the biggest non-conservative force that always interferes with this idea is friction. So you can manipulate the equation to account for friction, and it will continue to be true. Or you can think about work being done by friction, because friction itself is a force. But in, a, in, other case, in any case, you have to take into account the non-conservative forces or to think about them as a force doing work in some way. All right? All right, so then um, the section 13.1c uh, talks about the work, the energy principle uh, applied to a pendulum. And a pendulum, I'm going to let you guys go through this yourselves, but I'm just going to draw this and talk about this for just a moment. A pendulum is like the classic example of why we like to think about work and energy. Because if you think about it, if you put a pendulum in motion, um, what's going to happen is at the bottom of the arc, you're going to have a maximum amount of kinetic energy. And at this point, when it stops and changes direction, the kinetic energy is going to be zero. 
So what that implies is that there's some work done in that process, and it's work done against gravity, isn't it? I mean, in other words, you get to a certain point, and then it swings uh, as it responds positively to gravity, and then as it goes up on the other side, gravity slows it back down, and it comes back down again. But if you try to do this with forces, and you look at the fact that at every single location, the direction of the pendulum bob is changing, it becomes a very complicated problem. But when you talk about the work energy principle, and you realize that uh, the kinetic energy here, minus zero, is equal to either the positive or the negative of the work done by that process, becomes a very simple problem to solve. So there's a lot of problems that are much easier to solve using work and energy, but this is one I've never seen a dynamics book that doesn't put this in as the big example because almost everybody uh, can see the advantage to that pretty quickly. So it's a, it's a good principle. So the rest of section 13.1 just talks about that. And uh, then they also mention that the work done by friction is always negative. That's because friction always opposes motion. Friction never speeds you up. Friction always slows you down. So it's always opposed to the direction of travel. So those are just a couple of points um, to discuss. Okay, so now we have a force. We know what that is. That has dimensions of uh, force, right? Ha ha. Newtons, pounds of force. We've talked about work has dimensions of a force acting through a distance or a length. So we might have Newton meters or foot pounds. And now we're going to talk a little bit about power. Now, for those of you especially who are mechanical engineers, power becomes like 32% of your curricula when you get out of Northwest College. But power is work done per time, more or less. To be exact, it is uh, DUDT. Since work is not an exact differential, we this is the this is the pure form of the equation. But if you think about DU as being F dot DR over DT, uh, DR over DT is in general just velocity. So in that way, you can think about force uh, power as being a force acting through or being propelled with some sort of a uh, velocity. And once again, it's a dot product, and both of these are vectors. Now, if we take a look at this uh, base unit of a Newton meter, we also refer to that unit as a joule. All right, so Newton meter is the same as a joule. That means that power, uh, which... I don't even know what they designate power by. They just keep calling it power. They don't really have a, a variable that they use. Um, but if you think about power as being a Newton meter per second, which we could think of as being a joule per second, that has its own unit, which is called a watt. And I'm sure you've heard about watts before. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting that we are living in a time where we're seeing this changing is the meaning of the designation of a watt. I mean, it still means exactly the same thing. I don't mean that, but the way that we use it in the vernacular. And what I'm referring to is light bulbs. In incandescent light bulbs are rated by watts, okay? It's so like you might have a 100-watt light bulb. Well, what we're really talking about, we don't really care what the wattage is except for 100 watts is going to suck up electricity, so it costs you more money to run an incandescent light bulb uh, than it does an LED or a compact fluorescent. But they rated them in watts. But what they're really interested in is the illumination, which is in a measure of lumens. Okay? So what we're saying is there's a 100-watt light bulb will produce so many lumens. Okay? So that's how bright it will make the room around you. Well, if you're using a compact fluorescent bulb or an LED bulb, you'll get the same number of lumens for a lot less power. So if you had a 100 watt 
compact fluorescent bulb or a 100 watt um, LED bulb, it would be extraordinarily bright. Okay, so what they will tell you on a package, this way it's always fun to go shopping, it's never fun to go shopping with me, but uh, if you look at the package, it will tell you the same, it'll say 13 watts, the same brightness or equivalent to a 100 watt bulb. And that's actually about a fact. A CF bulb takes about one seventh as much power to get the same number of lumens as does an incandescent bulb. So next time you go to the hardware store or Walmart or the grocery store, take a look at a package of light bulbs. Because watts is a convention that we've used for a long time, but it really doesn't apply anymore. The other thing is that you can spot this from, have you guys ever, I don't know, I mean, incandescent light bulbs are sort of, they're definitely uh, on their way out if they're not out already, but have you ever touched like a, a, a lit up incandescent bulb? What happens? That's hot. What if you touch an LED or a CF? Not hot. That's, that's the watts right there. You're not losing watts uh, to the room. So, and it's also like incandescent bulbs, sometimes like they'll kill bugs, like you'll find bug kill around them because the bugs all got too close and died of, of I don't know, heat exhaustion or whatever they die of. But um, anyway, so this is just a convention, but what we're, we're not gonna talk about lumens in this class, but what we're really getting at is how many lumens are, uh, are is that going? But a watt is actually a measure of power. So um, what about in the, S that's in the SI system because everything's nice and logical. Watt was actually, the last name of a guy, James Watt, who did a lot of stuff with another unit of power, which is called horsepower. Okay, this is what we use in the United States, and a horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second. So, where did that come from? Well, it came from John Deere, who was an actual person from Moline, Kansas, when he was trying to sell prime movers of farm equipment to farmers in the early part of the 1900s. Because just like with the watts, what we're really concerned with is brightness. If you were farming with horses and somebody was trying to sell you a tractor, what do you think you'd be concerned with? Yeah, how many horses can I get rid of? If I, get, if I buy this tractor, how many horses do I no longer have to keep? Um, and so a horsepower is an estimate, not of all kinds of horsepower, and I mean not of all the things that horses can do, but a horse drawing a plow through a field, how many horses it takes. So once again, if you look at a car, the rating's a little bit different. If you look at a horsepower rating on a car, they look, the numbers are higher than they are for farm equipment. So once again, why it's never fun to go shopping with me because I'll point these things out to you. But uh, farm equipment, or like if you have a lawn tractor. Anyone have a lawn tractor, your parents? Okay, so if you have a little lawn tractor, um, they're usually like 10 to 13 horsepower. That means, it doesn't mean that you can drive it as fast as if you had a team of 13 horses, but what it means is it puts power to the blade to chew up the grass at the same rate as 13 horses would. I don't know how 13 horses would do that, but I'm just saying that's, that's, the, that's the equivalency. But the unit of horsepower, like so many units in the US customary system, is not particularly logical. But uh, it came out of some convention, which is why also the SI system, or the metric system, is a system of units. Uh, US system, I don't, it's not really a system at all. I just refer to it, and there's a lot of names for it. We don't even know what we call it. But I would call it the US customary system because most of our units arose from custom. But the bad news is, or the good news, even though we have several international students in this class, uh, because everybody deals with the United States and we use whatever the heck this is, everybody gets to learn it. So uh, I prefer the metric system, and I think most scientific people do. Uh, except for the fact that these things make more sense to me. Like if somebody said to me, your lawn tractor generates this many watts of power, I would not really have an idea of what that means. I would have to go back and convert it to horsepower so that I could decide how it compared to my old 13 horsepower lawn tractor. But I could get over that pretty quickly for the advantage of having a logical system of units. Um, the other thing about uh, power 
just like Newton's uh, go up in powers of 10 and go down in powers of 10. So you can have, you know, decinewtons, centinewtons. You could also have kilonewtons, meganewtons, and so forth. The same applies here. So you can have uh, watts, kilowatts, megawatts. Most household usage is measured in kilowatts. Uh, most, like if you have a dam or a power plant, they'll measure it in megawatts, and sometimes nuclear power plants would measure in gigawatts, which also can be pronounced gigawatts, which sounds ridic ridiculous, but it's still true. So uh, horsepower is, uh, the, why is it 550? Well, because that's how much John Deere decided a horse could pull, was 550 foot-pounds per second. So. And like I said, whether that's true or not, under what conditions, uh, you know, there it is. But that's where it comes from. So uh, the last little piece of information in our last three minutes together here um, is when we talk about work and energy. Once again, we know that we've got a force acting through a distance. And we know that in the SI system, we can call that a joule, kilojoule, megajoule, etc. 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth. In the US customary system, uh, we have 778 foot pounds is equal to something called a British thermal unit. And once again, I do not know why. Um, if you ever have the, if, you're, if you rent an apartment and you look at your power bill from MDU, if you look for, at your power bill from electricity, it will measure your usage in watts, not watts, but kilowatt hours, which is a strange unit as well because a kilo, they, they're not going to charge you for power. They charge you for the amount that you use. So a kilowatt hour is an amount that if you were producing or using a kilowatt, the rate of a kilowatt for one hour, that's what a kilowatt hour is. When you look at your power bill from MDU, if you have natural gas, they'll measure it in something called a decatherm, and a decatherm is 10 BTUs. So, uh, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Again, all these things happen, nobody asked me. I would have done it differently. So, uh, anyway, the other part is, is that, as I have said, the last little minute that I have with you uh, today is we talk about something called mechanical efficiency. Now, as I've said, uh, energy is conserved, uh, but it changes form. And so mechanical efficiency talks about how much um, of the energy or power that we want that we get over what we have to pay for or what we put in. So in other words, if you go back to that idea of an incandescent light bulb, it costs us 100 watts. That would be what we put in, or we could convert that to money. It doesn't matter as long as you have the same basis. But what we get out of it is just the light. We weren't really after the heat unless you have a strange application. I don't know what that would be. So you're still getting all the energy out. There's 100 watts power coming out of that bulb, but some of it's not what you want. So you're really measuring how much of it's turned into light in that particular case. So efficiency, mechanical efficiency, always depends on the situation. It depends on what you want and what you're, what you're having to pay. So like if you have a big steam boiler and you're putting out power into your house, or you're putting out heat, because what you want to do is to heat your house, and uh, in order to do that, you have to put work in. And then uh, you're getting heat out of this big boiler pan that you're burning coal or nuclear fuel or whatever, unless I'm not even putting work in. Um, whatever this is, this would be your work in. So that could be nuclear. It could be your wind turbine. It could be the gas that you have to pay for. And what you're getting out of that is heat your mechanical efficiency in this case would be the heat over the work that you had to put in. So, all right. So do you guys have any questions about this? Section 13.1. All right. So what I will do tonight uh, is I will put up a couple of problems right here. So under the submit homework for Chapter 13, 
I will put two or three problems for you to start tonight. Then on Wednesday, uh, we can discuss those problems uh, to any extent that you need, um, and then they, but I won't actually collect them until next Friday with the whole set. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a lovely day, and we will see you Wednesday.